we've been looking at various aspects over the last few weeks of um, attitudes, fruit, which is uh, which we emanate, becomes a power to change us, to change others, and so on. These are these are foundations. These are essentials if we are to go on in God. If we don't get these into place, we really will not go on in God. We'll just reach a plane and keep dropping back and up to that plane again. And uh, it's really important that we kind of uh, have these things, begin to have these things established within our hearts and within our lives. It's very important. You know, there's a coming great move of God. And uh, it's there's no doubt about that. But, you know, moves of God, they come and they go. And uh, they go because the people are not prepared and not... They don't have in place what is necessary to carry it on. And that's why they they go, they last for a period, and they begin to wane, that move of God. It may take the church a little higher, but um, if we're really going to maximize that which God is going to do, which is God is about to do that, we really need some of these things in place. You know, there is coming a great, miraculous move of God. There's coming a, a move of healing and miracles like... You know, it's going to be outstanding. And for us, for us to be a part of that, we need these things in place within our lives. And uh, God has to be able to trust us with that. And uh, we need them, need them to be in place. And so, you know, it's very important that we kind of recognize that and we keep working on it, you know? Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, humility is important. We need to be clothed in humility. It's important. It is the badge of honor. The Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. And we need to kind of have that in place within our, our lives. David, that great, great general, great King David said that God's gentleness had made him great. Not his fighting, but the gentleness of God made him great. Not all of his conquests, but the gentleness of God. He said, your gentleness has made me great. And it's very important that these attitudes um, uh, are in our lives. Humility is very, very important. Meekness, humility. And of course, we've been talking a lot about love, the importance of having that in place within our lives, becoming love. And we've been talking about thanksgiving. Being thankful for our present condition. <laughs> Being thankful for the situations we are in. Because it can all God can turn everything to good. He can cause all things to work together for good. And if we are thankful and continue in thanksgiving genuinely from the heart, we open up a channel for God to be able to work whatever it is in us, take us through those things, and we open up a channel of supply. And these are, you know, essentials which we have to be grounded in, okay? And, uh, and so it's really important. Last week we talked about the power of thought, how that our thoughts are created. And that, um, you know, man is, has a creative capacity, you know, and he operates in that either consciously or unconsciously. And uh, because of that, we have to be founded in love. And uh, we talked about that. You know, thoughts are seeds. When thoughts are connected with strong emotion, they become seed. Conception takes place. And if it's held in place, that thing will bring to pass. We are created that way. And it's one of the most important laws of his kingdom that all things reproduce after their own kind. Your thoughts will reproduce in your life and circumstances after their own kind. That is a law of the kingdom of God. And uh, so we talked about that at length last week. They produce sorts of thoughts, uh, a seed, we plant them all the time, conception takes place, and they come to fruition within our lives. We talked about taking responsibility for our lives and our circumstances. Circumstances and lives are a product of what we sow. Okay, now people find that hard to swallow because they said, you know, some of the circumstances in my life weren't caused by me. That might be so, but your reaction to them determines how quickly they change. Okay? So, we need to be aware of that, and uh, I want to continue on a little bit more today about the mind. 
understanding the mind and the thoughts. Um, there is no lot of salt for your mind. It's the greatest battlefield of all. Battlefield is not just spirit, it's your mind. Okay? The enemy will try and take your mind. And uh, Satan knows if your mind is knocked out, if your thinking is wrong, the whole person is out. Okay? And so there is a battle for your mind. And when your mind is single, you know, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is single, the whole body is going to be full of light. When your mind is free and released, you begin to open a doorway for God's light to flow to you. Okay? And so, get your thought life aligned with God and His Word and His purposes and the way He thinks. Paul says, casting down in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, he said, casting down every thought, imagination's thought, and every high thought that exalts itself against God, but's not in harmony with God, bringing to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay, Paul was aware of this battle. The battle is for your mind. Okay? And because when thought and emotion blend, you start to create a process. Now, Satan knows that. And so the battle is going to be for your mind. And your mind is open to and vulnerable to spiritual influence. Okay? Your mind is open to and vulnerable to the spirit realm. There is a unique connection between your mind and the realm of the spirit. Your mind is the gateway, you know, to the spirit. And... Your mind is the gateway to all incoming communications. Even though those communications may be in the realm of feeling, they will eventually register in the mind. And so, we talked a little, we, we dealt with this in, in a little lot more detail in, this, in that series we did on To Walk With God, but I want to touch on some things here again and just highlight some things again, you know. Defining the mind and the brain, you know. Your mind is a part of your physical body, right? It's a physical organ. Your brain is a physical organ, rather. Your brain is physical. You know, it's bioelectronic, it's magnetic, it's, it's an incredible, fantastic computer. But the Bible says that connected to the spirit, it becomes a living soul. Okay, a living soul. And it's capable of processing thought. Capable of, it can be used for thinking. It is very doubtful if your mind, brain can originate thought. Uh, it can be programmed. It will run according to the program. That's the scariest thing. Who or whatever programs your mind, the way you think, will determine how you walk, what your life is. That program will run, and that will be your life. And uh, Satan will try and program your mind, okay? We have a spirit linked. We have a spirit. Your spirit has the capacity to originate thought, the spirit, the image, the likeness of God. It's doubtful whether your brain can originate thought. It can process thought. It can come to conclusions. It can work with whatever you put into it. But only your spirit is inspirational. Okay? Now, it, it's... Animals have a brain, but they don't have a spirit. Okay, they are pre-programmed by God. They move on instinct, which has been programmed into them. You know, a dog, your dog can't originate thought, but it can be programmed to respond to food in certain ways. <laughs> and uh, that's how the train does. All right, man is different. He is a spirit and he has a brain. Now, made in the image of God, God is a spirit. And we have a spirit, and we have a physical brain. And when the two are not compatible, we have confusion in our lives. And we emanate that confusion. Now, we have the privilege and the awesome responsibility of reprogramming our brain. And then, of course, we will run according to that programming. Proverbs 22, 6, it says, If you train up a child in the way he should go, that's when he's young, it says, When he is older, he will not depart from it. If you program them right when they're young, 
they won't depart from it because the program will run. And the way they think is how they become. And as parents, we have the responsibility of training our children to think right. Because as they think, they will become. And so train a child. says, train of a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from that training. You know, he might have deviations, but it will be there. It will run according to the programming. But you see, we end up, the problem is, we end up with wrong programming up here. And uh, when you're born again, you're infused with the seed of God. And that seed, in that seed is all that God is. Plant it into your spirit and it begins to grow into the likeness of God. The very DNA, the very seed of God is planted into you. You're born again, the Bible says, of the seed of God. And that seed has everything that God is spiritually. And it will begin to grow. Given the right conditions, it will begin to grow. Your spirit will begin to be transformed in the image of the likeness of Christ. First Corinthians 2, 16, it says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he might instruct him? And then Paul says, But we have the mind of Christ. Where is that mind of Christ? In our spirit. Your spirit has a mind. It can originate thought. It is inspirational. And your brain will sit and sort information that is given to it and come to a conclusion based on what terms of conclusions you put in there. But your spirit is inspirational. Now, in order, in order for you to be full of light, your spirit and your brain must be in harmony. If your brain is not in harmony with your spirit, you will have a blockage. You know, we have this teaching, now, you know, your soul is not important, your brain is not important, all this. Well, why did God give us one if it's not important? It's very important. We need it. And uh, it's important to walk with God. And, you know, your spirit and your brain must harmonize. This is what we call the law, the kingdom law, the law of unity. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now what do we mean about the natural mind? The natural man or the natural mind? It is the mind that has been programmed with the concepts of this world and the kingdom of darkness. That's the natural mind. But God wants a different kind of programming up here, you know? And, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord has become one spirit. Don't think about that. The spirit has become one with the Lord. It has everything that God is, is in your spirit. Seed. It's in there. We are joined to the Lord. But the problem is up here, the brain is a terrible mix. Okay? It has some right concepts, it has some very wrong concept. Now, that becomes the problem. Now, when you are born again, your spirit and your brain are not compatible. They think differently. So what has to happen? This has to be reprogrammed. Think the way God thinks. Now, Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to the way the world thinks. Don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the reprogramming of your mind that you might prove what's the good and acceptable will of God. Now, we dealt with this at length in that series, Walking with God, but I'm not going to go into it at length today because we dealt with that. But your brain has, the brain has to be reprogrammed. You've got to get out the wrong programming, the things which are not true, concepts which are false, and we have to have those concepts replaced with truth, okay? Now, the basic standard for that is God's Word. God's Word is truth, whether you understand it or not. When God says it in His Word, see, there are many things in the Word of God which we are yet to uncover. It's truth. And we read them, 
and we just pass by because there's a layer there which we just is not not coming through to us. God's word is true, whether we understand it or not. And it starts with we accept God's word whether we understand it or not. It is God's word, it's what God says, therefore it is true. The acceptance of truth in God's word is the first, you know, stage. And the greatest hindrance is walking with God is the unrenewed brain. Okay. We talk about the engrafted word in that series, so I won't go over that again. But because as you think you become, your mind has to be reprogrammed. Because from a tiny little child, you had stuff put into your brain, a lot of stuff which is wrong, false concepts. Okay? Right from a little child, it has to be reprogrammed. And uh, again, we, we talk about love as being the key. And programming the mind, we have to take some deliberate steps. You know, in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4 and verse 8, it reads like this. Let me read it to you. Oops, I'm in Corinthians. Um, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. I'll find it for you. It says how we to think. It gives us a list of, um, you know, how we are to think. And how we are to think. Whatsoever things are what? Whatsoever things. And it, it gives us a list of things of how we are to think. Finally, brethren, I um, mean, Philippians 4 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. Now, that is a filter which you should filter all your thought life through. It's like a filter we place over our, our, our mind. If it doesn't fit into this car category, we should reject it. Okay? If it's not true, you know, it's not true, the love for the truth, reject it. Not honest, reject it. Not just. The thoughts are not just. The thoughts are not pure and lovely. Okay, and are your thoughts about each other always lovely? See, there's a filter here. You say, well, I've got good reason. You don't have any reason. You know? To give or perish. Love or stagnate. If it's not pure, if it's not lovely, it's not, it's not, here's a good one. If it isn't a good report, that cuts out all gossip. If it's not a good report, don't think about it. <laughs> Depends, you see, whether you want to be full of light or not. You know, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on those things. See, that's a filter for the mind. And, and that's in the Word of God for a specific reason. And not, in other words, to keep our thought life, to keep our mind programmed right, the way we think. You know, the Bible tells us that the natural mind, that is the, the secular mind, the mind that's been programmed with this world and its concepts, it says is an enemy of God. That's an enemy. God cannot get through to you. Even though your spirit might be pure, it still can't get through to you because your spirit has to come back through your mind to you. And uh, that's often, you know, the problem. What sort of things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, you know? Because you are creative and your thoughts are creative, you must apply this over. You know? Your brain, you see, is not some inferior thing. It's an integral part of our walk with God. The spirit is joined to the Lord, and then it ought to be joined to our soul. That is your brain. And when your spirit is not compatible with the way your brain thinks, you have a problem. If you get the two in union, 
You open a gateway where so much light and understanding and knowledge will flood into your being. It will be unbelievable. You understand the mysteries of the universe. You'll understand God. You'll understand the purposes of God. Because your brain is not running interference anymore. And that gateway is open. It only opens when the two really become compatible. It's really important to understand that. You know, your soul is undergoing transformation. You see, when your spirit came from heaven, it came from the the, the it came from the heavenly realms, and we really want we don't need to get into what your spirit was before, but your spirit came from the heavenly realm and has been in existence a long time. Okay? Now your spirit has memories of that that life in heaven. However, when it's cold, it's the soul of those memories are lost. Uh, the spirit came into your body at birth. You are born again. And in other words, God's DNA, because now your spirit is undergo, un, going to undergo transformation. And that is, to be born again, and now become part of the family of God, the, the sons of God, by regeneration, by the seed being placed into your spirit. Now, your soul, you know, the Bible talks about Adam. God formed him out of the earth. He formed him out and he breathed into him the breath of life. He's God breathed into him spirit. And when he did that, the Bible says he became a living soul. Now, his soul powered up, became alive, became aware. He had a living soul. Now, if that soul eventually is not saved, it is lost. But your spirit returns to God and has not fulfilled its mission. You say that again. Because it might take a few weeks to grab a hold of it. Your spirit came from God. But if your soul is not eventually saved... The soul is lost as a living entity, and your spirit returns to God. The Bible is very clear on that, but it's not fulfilled its mission. It hasn't evolved, that's a bad word, but you know what I mean. I'm not talking about Darwinism. It hasn't evolved into that new creation that God intended, spirit, soul, and body. You see, Jesus was impregnated into Mary as a spirit, living spirit came from God. He was born as a man. And today, he was changed forever. He became a man with a body and a soul. And today, he is a man with a body and a soul. He didn't have that when he came. He was implanted into Mary. He was just spirit. But here we have a new creation coming forth. Spirit, soul, and body. Jesus has a resurrected body. He now has a soul. Because he became a man. And it was God's intention that we grow beyond just spirit, but become a new creation again in this universe as a human being with a spirit and a soul and a body saved and transformed. That's why Paul says, I pray that your spirit, soul, and body might be presented blameless to the Lord at his coming. Now, I've said some things there. It might take you a while to just to kind of think about, um, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's very, very important. It is God's purpose that we, as spirit, soul, and body, blend as one. And that is a far greater creation than just the spirit. It's a far higher creation, has greater capabilities, because it can interact with the physical world and the spiritual realm. And there is a thought that the spirit realm is becoming physical anyway. We recreation. See, God continues to expand in concept and thought and purpose. You know? 
heaven was first a spiritual world that God created the earth and brought, said to Adam, bring heaven to earth, bring it into a physical dimension. When you were born again, Christ came into your spirit. That seed was in, put into your spirit. Okay? And now you are more than just spirit. You have a living soul that is supposed to become one. When that union takes place, you will become full of light. It's, uh, am I getting too, too above? Is this alright? We kind of need to kind of grasp some of these things. Um, you know, we are transformed, the Bible says. You are transformed, great Greek word, metamorpho, which, you know, that word which transformation, metamorphosis transformed from a one state to another like a caterpillar to a butterfly. It says when your mind is renewed, reprogrammed, you will be transformed. Transformed. Now think about that. Why? Because when your mind is compatible with your spirit, light floods in, not just into your spirit, but into your soul and into your body. The two begin to move. To your brain, the mind is the key uh, to the whole thing. And uh, perfection, God's after perfection in soul and spirit for the resurrection body. You know, that becomes one fabulous entity in power and light and glory. That's a much higher creation than just your spirit. A much better creation. It's a new creation. That's why God says, I'm making a new creation. You're in your spirit, but I'm going to make a new creation from that. It's going to have soul. It's going to have body. It'll interact with the spirit world and the physical world. Okay, the natural mind is the problem. You know, we've been trained in deductive reasoning based on rules of logic, and it's a secular mind, wrongly educated. Romans said in, in Romans 8, 6, says a natural mind, to be naturally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the natural mind is the enemy of God. It is not subject to the law of God, the ways of God, neither indeed can it be. It's been programmed from another kingdom, kingdom of darkness. Okay. And so what happens when your spirit is longing to move in God? Your brain objects. Your brain can't keep up with that. Your brain does not think same way. And you're stopped in your tracks through unbelief because your brain runs counter to what's in your spirit. Now, if you can get the two in harmony, you will do greater works than he has done. Get it into harmony, you'll be full of light. If the two come together, oh, hallelujah. So you've got to allow your brain to be reprogrammed. And, uh, you know, it's very important because, you know, your brain is programmed by the five senses primarily by hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, tasting. The five senses. Is that five? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd miss one out there. <laughs> okay. It, it's programmed by what you see, what you hear. It comes in. It's bombarding you all the time, right? You turn the television on. There you go. At the word, it's people's concepts. It's all there. You read a book, it's there. You open a magazine, it's all happening. And your brain is an incredible computer to store all that away. I mean, you know, it, there's a hard disk in there which never runs out of memory. That's always there. There's more and more. There's more and more comes in. Ah, your brain has a mix of all kinds of stuff. Programmed. Your brain can also be programmed through what we call revelation. That's, that's truth coming from God. Supernaturally, revelation. Inspiration and revelation. Or by the kingdom of darkness. It can also be by direct input by God or Satan. We call this revelation. A lot of the realms where we are affected by is role models. I mean, kids, teenagers, particularly, are programmed by role models, right? That becomes a role model, so they're thinking.
thinking of that model is then programmed into them. The way they act, the way they are, the way they dress. You know, is that a teenager? Is it a role model? Okay, the programming comes across. Concepts, values, and so on. Objecting to a concept or a value stops it being programmed into your brain. The power to say no to something, you have an enormous power just to be able to say no. It stops it. You see, it's only what you accept or through passivity, non-objecting, that the thing is programmed into you. So you see something on television, you read something, it's a concept, you can either accept that or consciously reject it. The power to say no will stop it coming through. And, uh, you know, what you feed your brain on is of utmost importance. The battle is for the programming of your brain. Whoever gets that gets you. Now, a program can be erased, and it can be erased in a number of ways. The power of the Holy Spirit can erase false programming in your brain. Um, you know, that can happen through what we through a, a, an administration of God, which we call fire. In 1 Corinthians 3, in verse 13, let me just read it to you. And this is what happens in revival. I want to talk to you about this for a moment, but because it's important. In, in the concept uh, comes from First Corinthians chapter three and verse thirteen. It says, "Every man's work shall be made manifest, so that day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is." And only that which remains after the fire has gone through receives a reward. Now, think about that principle, okay? The principle is this. Fire goes through and it wipes out everything that's not of God. And only what remains is of God do you get a reward for. That's the principle it's talking about, okay? So it has a way of sifting out. The chaff, sifting out everything in our life which was not of God and just leaving behind what was God. So we stand before God on that judgment day. And God will go, Whew! the fire will go through you. And we'll be, we might be a little surprised of how little there's left. The day will reveal it, the Bible said. <laughs> Only that which was of God remains. And as a reward. Now, that's the principle. Now, you see, when revival comes, you get a move of God, and God sweeps into a church. Or, and, and let's face something. We are looking for not a church revival. We are looking for a national revival. Church revivals do not last. They impact a small area around their community and disappear again. Now, let's set our sights a little higher than that. The Welsh revival was a national revival, not a church revival. Okay? Now, there are areas where God touches people and revives them. There's a time of reviving again. But we've got to look to God for the nation to experience revival. But you see, when, when a move of God sweeps by through the church, if it's intense enough, the fire of that move of God, people are so impacted by the power of God, might bring repentance, a deep level, or all kinds of things, all kinds of manifestations. But the impacting of that fire of God has the ability to erase wrong programming. And that's wonderful. And people are in ecstatic for weeks. However, if you do not keep your mind programmed right, you will just relapse back after 12 months or so, and just back to where you were. Because you're starting to reprogram your mind again with things that are going to cut you off from the Spirit of God. You see, it's wonderful to have a move of God, but most of them wane and just dissipate. And this is one of the reasons. It's not the only reason. But you see, the people, that fire can touch a person and, and, and erase a lot of that stuff. 
by a sovereign work of God and they get up transform people they feel wonderful they're different people for weeks and months on end but they don't know how to walk in it and eventually it drops off until you get it one year two years down the way and they're talking about wasn't that a wonderful move of God but they're back to where they were because they don't know how to live in the kingdom principles they don't know how to live in kingdom laws uh, it's you know it's important to understand that and the Bible talks about he shall abide the day of his coming he shall be like a refiner's fire Mal Malachi 3 verse 2 you purge however you can have a beautiful empty clean vessel in this world so many influences again and if you do not know how to keep your mind clean pure upright It'll be reprogrammed on the kingdom of darkness and the concepts of that world. Okay, let's look at evil spirits in your mind. Evil spirits lodge over the brain and control your thinking and imagination. Can do that. When this is the case, deliverance is required to set you free. Now, deliverance can occur a number of ways. There is a kingdom law, you see. We are made in such a way... God made us this way. We are made in such a way that we can be influenced by spiritual entities, things from the spirit realm. And if we continue to yield to that influence, it will become a part of us. That's how we're made. That's how you were born again. You had an influence of the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit upon you. When you finally yielded to it, it became a part of you. That's the principle. The principle saint is true of the whole of the spirit realm. So we are made. We can be influenced by the spirit realm. And if we accept that influence, a period of time you accept it, it will join itself to you. It will become part of you. And uh, it will attach itself. You see, these spirits attach themselves to a thought or a concept, or a cast of mind, and that's where the stronghold is. They build a stronghold in the mind, and their power is that they are attached to a false concept. They, 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 are, they are attached to a false concept, a lie, which is not the truth. Those spirits attach themselves to that cast of mind, that way of thinking, that concept, those set of values, which are not true, and so that leaves a position for these demonic spirits to clothe your mind. Okay? And uh, they will then strengthen that concept. You see that with people with certain cast of mind. It is so difficult to change them when it's obviously wrong to others. But it is so difficult to change them because it is spiritual. And almost impossible to kind of... And get them out of those casts of mind. So that spirit, hear me up again, it builds a house, it, it attaches itself to a lie, a false concept, something which is not pure or is not the truth, and it attaches itself to that, and it continues to strengthen itself and feed into your mind. Okay? It'll feed into your mind by thoughts. It'll feed into your mind by, through your imagination, pictures. It'll feed through you by feelings. And when that happens and that gets a stronghold in you, you need deliverance. Now, because this, it's built, the spirits, you see, have built a stronghold there. And uh, it just sits there. And these then become random thoughts. They can be unclean thoughts. They can be unclean pictures. They can be pornographic, that's one cast of mind, or they can be just false concepts, they can be just lies. There's, a, there's certain kinds of spirit which just sit over a person and just continually lie about other people. That's why the things that says, what's in the things are a good report, only think of those things. Filter it out. These are demons, these are spirits. And uh, he, the Bible tells us that he from the beginning, 
is very from the beginning, he was the father of lies. Okay, so he'll sit there and lie to you quite often about other people. And, dis- and, and then deluded Christians call that discernment. You hear what I'm saying? They have a thought about someone else, something is wrong, and they haven't filtered it out. After a while, they think they are getting discernment. And they are deceived by a deceiving, lying spirit. Let me just say something to you about true discernment. And you need to put this as a benchmark. If God shows you something negative about a person, or if what, let's say that again, if you're shown something, or feel you've been shown something negative about a person, and it causes you to think wrongly of that person, you have been deceived. When true discernment comes about a person, it comes with a manifestation of love, and it comes with the right attitude. You will not think bad about that person, nor will you divulge it to someone else. And if you have what you call discernment, and it causes you to think evil about that person, that discernment does not come from God, because God does not cause you to sin. And most of Christian discernment, so-called, is in that category. Now, I want you to spend a couple of weeks thinking about that. Yes, let's make some adjustments here. It's very, very important that we kind of, you know, get this thing right. You know, and so these spirits sit over your mind. You know, you lose control and can't stop thinking that way. You've lost control of it. You have a spiritual problem. You have random thoughts which you can't stop, uh, which you obviously are not right. You've got a problem, you know. If you open the door to that through whatever, um, if it was through pornography, you need to deal with that. But sometimes, you know, it's just entered into you through passivity. You haven't rejected it enough to close the door when it comes. See, spirits come and test you. This will come along and give you an imagination, maybe an unclean imagination. And it will stand back and watch what you do with it. If you don't accept it, the door's closed. But try again. And you might try this over a period of time. If you keep closing that door, he'll give up. That you closed the door. Okay, so it's where you respond to thought, not having the thought. So these spirits will come along and they'll try you out. The, the spirit realm has an incredible capacity to interact with your brain. And it can put in pictures, it can put in thoughts, it can put in concepts, it can put into all those kind of things. And if you don't object, it will make its nest there and have children. And you have a big problem. All right? If you open the door, you, you consciously open the door, you need to repent of that. You have to begin to take back your mind. You have to realize that you are dealing with an entity and with a spirit. You're not dealing with a concept. You're dealing with an in, a personality. And you have to treat it as such. Personality which is attached to your thoughts and concept. You need to renounce and disown the thought or thought patterns. And you need to continue to do that. Not just once. Every time it happens, even though you're not free, every time it happens, renounce it straight away. Take authority over it. Don't accept it. But deal with it as a person. It is a personality. Deal with it as a demonic spirit and address it as a demonic spirit. Take authority over it and tell it where to go, where it's hot. And get rid of it. Okay? Just deal with it. And you've got to be persistent, because it's going to be persistent with you. Particularly if you open the door to it. You've got to start closing the door. You're dealing with demons, personalities, which hold their whole nature, the whole nature of that spirit is the nature of the lie. 
And it just infuses you with that. You get to run thoughts, it runs here, it runs there. And if you hold them long enough in focus, that's the creative side of us. And it's the way God uses us to create us because we are creative beings. Your dreams, your daydreams, your dreams, your vision must be in line with God has given you and called you to and what your future is. Anything else, don't dream today, dream about it. And that might require some discipline for some of you. Okay? But you see, our mind is so loose, it's so scattered, it's so compassive and we're off, you know, in some trip somewhere. Pull it in. Take authority. Take control of your mind. Renounce these all those thoughts and thought patterns. Take authority over the spirit, constantly commanding it to leave you. You must be very strong with this. You know, it's not enough to be meek and quiet with these spirits. You have to be strong. And you have to assert, take back your mind. It is yours. Take it back from these spirits. Take authority over it the spirits and, and then begin to fight set up a fight this is war and you must fight it you must be persistent and you must get your mind back from these spirits watch all the things are pure and just bring your mind back into a right filter of what comes through your mind for some of you it might require some real repentance you know you've opened the doors deliberately by daydreaming or whatever, fantasy, whatever. Now it has a hold on you. Or it can be hereditary. It can come on down the line or it can be things that happened to you in, in, in your past life. You, you, when you were children. <laughs> when you were children. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. You know, but the principle is the same. Take your mind back. Take authority over it. Take responsibility for your life. Rise up against it in strength and in power. Get angry with it. It's your mind. Kick it out. This will be a battle. He'll say we'll fight against you. Unless you do this, nobody can take your mind back for you. Only you can. Very, very important. Now, if we can come to compatibility between your brain and your spirit... You know, see, we are limited. You are very. We are limited in to, to, to uh, in our ability to receive true light and understanding because of this problem. We're limited to the. We are limited to the small. Our lives are limited to the smallness or the largeness of our thinking. Let me say that again, because you see, Christians have this weird idea that everything is spirit. You are limited. To the largeness or the smallness of your thinking, you will never go beyond it. That will be the measuring rule. Not your spirit. Your thinking. Your spirit has no problem with largeness. But this does. And the small-mindedness, the smallness of our minds, in our illogical concepts and Block us out. That mind becomes the bottleneck for us to move on in God. The brain just is the main problem. Okay. Now it's time, you know, to take back your mind. Because if you can get a compatibility, even a small amount of compatibility, between your spirit and your brain, you'll start to fill up with light. You'll see... You know, the wonders of God. You'll begin to understand like never before. The creative side of your life will begin to blossom. You begin to flow into your destiny. You see, many people have a destiny and never fulfill it because they can't see it. And don't believe it. Their mind is not big enough to accommodate their destiny. Their spirit is, but your brain is not big enough to accommodate it. God's going to have a people in these last days that are going to do great things. Things which never dreamt were possible to us. But we're going to do it. This is an expansion taking place at this level which will accommodate our spirit. And if this is small, 
narrow-minded, petty. It'll block us out. And that's why the church has remained uh, largely across the face of the earth with no impact. So the spiritual side rather hadn't had this right. The mentality has been wrong. You see, and when we calm down and finally the Lord comes, and we step into the millennium reign of Christ, you see, we've had this concept of, you know, oh, God's going to change us all when we come into the millennium. Well, He ain't going to do that. He's going to have to be changed before we get there. And stepping over into millennium will be just like walking from where we are, just stepping over. Taking our same concepts, our same faith levels, and everything else. It's not some, you know, God's not going to come down with his fairy wand and go, whew, and you are changed. Okay, we've got to be changed now. And not everybody, by the way, gets into the millennium reign of Christ. Okay, you've got to advance to a certain state to get into the millennium. The rest remain in heaven for a thousand years. Oh, that's another story. But no. <laughs> but it's true. We have this concept. The rapture is coming. We're all going to be caught up to heaven and, and changed. And then we're all going to go into the millennium. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. You know? You have to qualify for some of these things. And how you think now, really. You know, we're going to do big things in the millennium. Going to rule the world. So you better start thinking that way now. Anything is possible. All things are possible for those who believe. We can have such an impact on this world, we can bring back the Lord. We can have such an impact evangelistic wise on this world through enlarged thinking that we can't, this world, there will be more people end up in heaven which will end up in hell. We can see this generation scoop the pool in salvation across the world and see multitudes come into the kingdom of God. We can see it, but we can't do it by just coming to church every week. You've got to think beyond. You've got to be bigger things. You've got to be better ways of doing it. And we have to be ready for this move of God that is coming. Otherwise, we'll just be blessed by it, but we'll fall back into our former state after 12 or 18 months. Because we don't know how to walk in the principles of the kingdom of God. And so we'll just file our minds up again and be back to where we started. Take responsibility for your mind. Take it back from the enemy. It is a fight. And he is going to lie to you all the way down the way. It's his favorite weapon is lying to Christians. Either about themselves, he lied to you about yourself and how you feel about yourself, or he'll lie to you about other Christians. How many of you know God doesn't tell you bad things about other Christians? Come on. Where's the deception here? Oh, but I've got discernment. I'll tell you, he does not tell you those things. Of course, it's unless you can handle it, and unless, unless you can handle it in love and right, he will not show you those things. He doesn't cause you to sin. And I've, had, I've seen people say, oh, God showed me this about this person, and their attitude is so rotten towards the person. You think, well, that certainly wasn't God, because the fruit of that revelation is destroying you <laughs> with your attitude towards that person. Did that come from God? Hey? Did it? Not enough. Does that come from God? Yeah. Better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I believe in these spirits. I believe in these heaven. I believe God shows us things. Shows you things, especially plus one, to pray for the person in love. And the minute you open your mouth to someone else, you disqualify yourself. End of story. If people would get the hang of that, we wouldn't have so much turmoil in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, it's exciting. Here we've got a bit of work to do. But if you understand...
understand how it works, you can approach it with clarity and with faith.